you hear it? Did you hear one less? One less. And thank you to that one. It's only going to take a handful of us. And maybe quite a big, it has to be quite a big handful, but it's going to just take a few of us. And I think something starts to move a lot faster than nobody doing anything. And I think we have one more that stepped up and found out it's really not that difficult. And I'm encouraged by it. Again, it doesn't take much to excite me. But we all just step up and do what we need to do. Find the thing we want to make right, make it right. Whatever we think, we hope, we hope, and hopefully we're all insane about that. Not like what we see, that those that think that they're doing right is, now we see globalization and sustainable development and, or an organization that's stealing from you to fortify them. And we don't, and we're silent to that, crickets to that. And it's, it's as simple as jumping back in and engaging those criminals. And, and that's just the thing that astonishes me. Before I go too far, this is BTW RLM 290. For those on the rebroads or past casts or wherever we are, you want to get to the content, you can get to the documents that I'll post. But I've been asking for people to get engaged and just write letters, if nothing else. And uh, someone has. And so I want to show you, well, I'll just read to you what they came up with as a comment. And they took my lead. Uh, and uh, some things I I didn't really have the chance to go back uh, real and look in depth. But th they've added their own part, which is perfect. That's how where this happened. You just start on the, on the journey and you start to pick up what you need. And so I just want to go through the document a bit. In fact, the whole ty whole thing. It's it's only a page and a quarter or something. And here's the pop point. It's it, it's a response to an agency that wants to take away what I can see now to be a. Now, not only is it natural, but it's 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 a plant, and uh, we're talking about cannabis here or hemp, and the government wants to make it all hideous and, and take away a real. It appears to be a real aid to a lot of people for a lot of reasons, notwithstanding what experts say. In this case, the agency is an expert. In other words, it's worse than actually an expert. It's considered a lawmaker. Now, you figure out, you tell me how, in a constitutional, a limited form constitutional republic, an agency got the right to be a lawmaker, and I'll show you, you don't live in a constitutional republic anymore. And being the case, there's a certain way you have to restructure how you think and how you respond to this. And until we fix this, things will be managed in your life in such a way as to profit others to your detriment. You become you become the thing that the object of their profit, and you are the you are manipulated in a way that will extract from you as much as it can be had from you, even unto death. And that's the thing that people, I think, are missing this whole point. But that just means you're not in that government they told you about. So everyone who thinks that they know what the government is that they have, that they're in, I don't really I have no idea in, the, in my mind that never comes to my mind that says they know what they're talking about. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. What I then have to tell you that in my study over quite a few decades, it means we're in an occupied country, an occupied territory. And we have a couple of layers of how that was done. And if you look closely, you can find the connection points. And so this starts to become real easy to solve. They have Achilles heels. They have all the most the same connections. However, they're coming at us. They're, they. It's coming at us. And it was up to us to stop it. And international law knew about it. And if you knew about Machiavelli just a little bit, you'd realize that this is not a peaceful place and you're going to have to protect yourself against non -peaceful, unpeaceful people. Of whatever of whatever uh, adjective you want to call them, and so the current <laughs> mode to do that is through an administrative process. And I've been asking you all just to, if you have a passion of something, or you feel threatened that someone's taking something, and you want to, you're the com up until now you've been complaining about the government doing stuff. Then I'm asking you to step up and protect yourself in those areas, not to do everything, not to even understand what I thought. I think I do know in action, because we do quite a bit. I do quite a comprehensive attack across a broad spectrum. But it's all usually based on someone's initiative. And so this is where we're at today. Someone came up and did what I asked. They 
They've made a letter, a comment, and they've sent it in. I'm told they've sent it in. They've sent it in two ways. But let me go through it right now. And you can hear a bit of what I talked about uh, on the broadcast. And you're going to hear, I hope, I think, you'll hear some original input. In other words, there was some, some looking into the process, which you have to do, or the points uh, to bring forward. And what this letter does is it puts someone now in a position, whether they choose to do it, and any one of you can, can do this, it puts you in a position to be that stick in the spokes in the future if you choose to do a review if the standard for the administrative procedures is not met by the agency doing the implementation. I made a couple of suggestions. They seem to be adopted. The writer, the author, got back to me and said, this is what I'd like to do. What can you? What do you see in it? And I offered only two, well, three things, an adjustment on one point and then a, a more full entry to get into what the author wanted to do relative to what I understand in a very thumbnail section. Now, this is not even a full, a full discussion. This is a thumbnail listing, as I, he did what I explained, a thumbnail out a, an argument, throw it down, and, uh, and, and see, see where it flies. And it can go a lot more, but it, uh, as I said, it, I don't think it needs to, and depend, it all depends on what you put forward. But here's, here's what somebody put together, that I, if I could see tens of thousands of these like this, not identical, but we're hitting all different points, I, I think we start to push, we can do two things. Once we get activated in a way that's not threatening to us, in a place that's very threatening, and you'll hear about it, hopefully I get to the story today, just a touchstone and all these other things that we see. But you also engage and more formally start to learn how to engage those people that we're complaining are taking us down and interfering with the things we need. And to what? You say, why? Well, because they monopolize it to their licensees. And so uh, has anybody thought, too, that we have this thing, the baby boomers have come up right at the time they needed this thing. It's now becoming pressure to take it back but that the government knew to take it early on, this thing they would need that would interfere with what the licensees that the government itself gives. In other words, a li and remember, a license is a permission to do that which is otherwise not lawful. And the, and the way they get around is they say, well, if you f follow these guidelines, the so-called ethics, then we're going to go ahead and license that to that limit. And this is how everything functions if you look very carefully. And this is what I talk about the policies and the policy considerations and getting things written down and making sure now in this world everything is written down. If you thought it was a common sense or common right or whatever, you better get that written down because there's no recognition of it anymore. And then you better move to the next point, which people seem to miss, accountability for the failures. Because that's completely washed out. So this is not yet accountability, but it's putting upon the agency a notice. And that notice is what this will state, and this is in response to the agency's notice, notice opportunity, time and place, the due process to you that they're moving in a certain direction. And so you're now in a due process consideration that when they say they've fulfilled it and there's no objections, they win. This letter helps to start the process of question. Now, I'm not going to analyze, I'm going to try and read it right on through, and then we'll go back and, re and do a few, a little bit, a little bit of analysis of why some things are there. This is a process. It doesn't mean you put this thing in and you win. It means you put it in and be persistent to stick with it. And what the point next point will be is that the agency will answer. And you have to then qualify whether or not that's sufficient answer in law or whether or not it answers even to the boundaries the courts have given to an agency to be a lawmaker. What they call deference. What they call that a Chev the Chevron case is, a, is the major, major problem here. But that's the standard that uh, you then analyze the response in the context of whether or not they actually, what they call meaningfully, addressed that. And if they didn't, and it, of, and it affects you, and you can show it so affects you, not just affects you, but affects you sufficiently, if you can hear all the, all the protection the occupying force has given itself, it still prevails once you can just articulate that point. And you'll hear, when I get through this document, you'll hear how I don't think they can answer to some of this. So any answer is going to be a problem unless they tell the truth, and then they can't do what they're going to do. And that's the point you want to write the comment. But that this, this is the response to a notice, to be responsive, to cut, uh, to interfere, if you, if you can, with something that I believe is a wrongful interference. This author thinks the same way, and they've written this comment. So and I'll start just from the top. I'll just read it through. 
I'm not going to read all the all the chemical elements. A lot of them are just fentanyl. And I want you to think about that. In the subject matter of the docket, fentanyl is one of the considerations. Lots of types of fentanyl. And then they talk about cannabis or THC. I'll just say it that way. Do I, get, do I have to say it all? Tet, what, tetra 9, tetrahydrocannabinol. Cannabinol? No, I didn't even say that right. Tetrahydrocannabinol. Got to slow down. Anyway. So they, they have a lot of fentanyl in this, and then all of a sudden they throw in, like, as an, as an aftershot, afterthought, cannabis. And then they only recognize the THC side. And, what, and, and so you have to understand how this works out, and, what, and that gives you an opportunity as you move this through. For you, you can analyze the anomalies within the notice. And as I've told you, as we do in the mining law side, and the rules and all that, we show that the notice is fraudulent up front. It, could, it can't be a notice sufficient to allow for a meaningful comment, neither than a meaningful interpretation. And so you, you strike them on the due process side. But the, here's this, uh, this comment says this. Someone who took up my suggestion, and I, appreci- I can't appreciate it more. Certified mail number, return receipt requested. The number will be put in. It's on the top of their letter. Docket number FDA. Hyphen two zero one eight hyphen nine hyphen three six eight five four quote international drug scheduling convention on psychotropic substances single convention of narcotic drugs and then they name a bunch of fentanyl and then they get down to this well they have also tramadol and pregabalin and I wasn't even interested in all that because this is not what the comment was to and it goes to cannabis plant and resin extracts and tinctures of cannabis, tetranine, tetrahydrocannabinol, stereoisomers of tetrahydrocannabinol, requests for comments. Thank you for making a public inquiry about cannabis, although I don't understand why by the Fed regulation notice itself that this forum is necessary in the first place. More importantly, because of the facial incongruities in the notice, I have no meaningful opportunity to respond. It also appears by this notice that an agent that the agency does not intend to treat the subject matter appropriately, and therefore any response under this notice is futile, futile. These failures of due process violate the Administrative Procedures Act for not at the very least providing a platform to make a meaningful process constituting a lawful proceeding. Here are some of the many reasons why I I am confused. Number one, the FDA is asking if cannabis should be reclassified for its current Schedule 1 status, which claims that the substance has no medicinal value, while at the same time, one, the text, the text is uh, this, the text in this very Federal Register filing acknowledges that the plant and its byproducts have pain-relieving and anti-inflammatory properties. And second, Despite prohibiting cannabis and extracts extracts, uh, with cannabinoids, the DAA has approved the cannabinoid cannabinol CBD for use in the pharmaceutical drug drug Epidiolex to treat seizures. Number two, in addition to the information in this Federal Register inquiry already stating the medicinal value of the cannabis for reducing pain and inflammation, There is ample evidence of the plant's medicinal qualities that states where it has been legalized from states, excuse me, where it has been legalized in some capacity. The United States Health Department holds patent number 6,630,507, which describes cannabis as an antioxidant and a neuroprotectant that is useful for treating inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. Number three, the definition document from 21 U.S.C. Section 802, Food and Drugs, describes an addict as someone who habitually uses the narcotic drug, yet the definition for narcotic drug is the same document notably, in this same document, notably excludes cannabis. Number four, this inquiry is based on the regulations of cannabis as part of the 1971 Convention of Psychotropic Substances, an international agreement that has already been disregarded by Canada and Uruguay, which have legalized cannabis and acknowledged that the plant has medicinal values. 
cannot and cannot in this next point cannot supersede U.S. Constitution, federal or state laws, or prior obligations and duties of the United States, which evidence duties to protect vested, granted exclusive possession, enjoyment, or use, including cannabis or hemp production, including every byproduct such as CBD and other cannabinoids, which, though irrelevant to the vested right to do so, also, except for fraud, have not been legitimately found to be, to be lawful, harmful, excuse me, not to be harmful, but, the con but to the contrary are healthful, and right of farm to market. Additionally, international or commercial regulation or advice cannot, pursuant to such constitutional grant obligations and duties, extend to infringe unreserved congressional land disposal by such grants to exclusive private production enjoyment, and other appurtenant vested rights. Further, being that in the current uh, contemplation there is no requirement, required clause saving such obligations of the United States from any interference, any infringement under color of authority without stated lawful warrant, as intended by the regulation or advice, if allowed, would constitute conduct or by omission, or if to hand those vested exclusive rights and property held against the world the whole world to a third party without right, will be at least multiple felonies, fiduciary breach by the grantor's federal agency, would impermissibly encroach upon the Tenth Amendment of the United States Constitution, or would make war upon the laws of the United States. Because of safety concerns, I require my private information to be withheld from disclosure to the limit of the law. And he, the signature will be there with the date, and then he's certified mail return receipt requested. So, the last paragraph was quite a long way. That is, if you haven't gathered what I contributed, and for lots of reasons it had to be what it is. But let me go through some of this. If you notice, we're putting up the vested congressional obligations. It's the government obligations to your land. Through that patent that you find in the record I keep talking about, did not have reservations against the production of hemp. In fact, at the time, they were growing hemp for ropes, remember, and the, and the military. And so you start to work back you through your history when you start to work down how this works out, and you'll find out that, that the government of the United States cannot actually present a problem against production or what comes from at least the hemp. For the right now, we're, we're putting that out because they don't change. You've now seen the DEA will not determine it's different than cannabis. And they've changed that from the law of marijuana. So we have a bunch of problems here that we could go into that you didn't have, that the author didn't have to go through here, but I'm telling you, once you start to analyze this for your for your discussion in the future, should they not answer to it, you get to put in a, fo a following answer, or as a review by the court to whether or not they took a meaningful and hard look at what they were doing. They can't disregard it. They brought it to public notice. Now you jump in and you hold them to the point. You have to know what that point is. So let me offer some things. I, again, I thought this was an excellent thumbnail. I think it, it preserves quite a bit. It talks uh, about certain things that are uh, Anomalies that don't allow you to respond, if they were really interested in, respond, in allowing you to respond, that's a failure in the process right there. So I hope you appreciated hearing all that. And uh, let me go through and say, uh, explain a couple of things here on the administrative imposition. Now remember, this is an international inquiry. This wasn't just domestic. So on the other side of the pond, this, these, in, uh, these same things can be used on the other side to say, you folks... Uh, it's already acknowledged in their federal notice that you folks on this side are mistreating this this plant, and so you can you can fire off a, a fraudulent imposition on that side because now this side has said has acknowledged in their notice, not you, but notice that there's a problem. There's many problems that are now exposed by this this one letter, and there's tons more. As I said, I, there's just tons more. The things I just look at. There's so much. It would take lots of us to do this. And we could just blanket this thing, that are us that are interested. Again, I've got so much to do. It's not something that I'm focused on. Uh, but you're getting up to the baby boomers that need this stuff, and now there's a chance to, to wrest it back from the government, which was already in you to have, that they stole from you all. And, and again, uh, a letter seems a lot simpler than uh, being threatened by the government uh, or the point of a gun uh, when you have now, you're wielding the condition against their uh, purported authority. So let's look at what did we say up in the beginning of this. Uh, thanks. Again, it's all cordial. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to respond. 
right? But that's the requirement under law. We have we talk about the notice itself, and what do we say about that up front? We said I have no mean he said the author, I have no meaningful opportunity to respond. The whole process is requires meaningful response. And you hear me say this over and over throughout the years when I talk about this process. And I even talk about it in how the government's supposed to respond to you. It has to be meaningful. That we let the government off when it's not or it doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do and we don't do something, some take some handle of some remedy, is our problem. In other words, they get away with it and you let them. We had a republic if we could keep it. That's how we were supposed to keep it. The educated masses in, in vigilant response to an encroachment. And so, again, all you all that think you know, you can know all you want. You contemplate your navel on that rock all you want. But if you want to keep the republic, you're going to have to get it engaged. That's the demand. And I think this is a simple way to do it. Actually, I can't tell you how much I'm uh, glad to see the letter come out and just be a, a start of a stick in the spokes. One more, folks. And so we have a notice requirement. The requirement of the process, you define it right up in the first. Here it's the second paragraph. No meaningful opportunity to respond. They're typically going to, they have to answer to that. And the way they answer that, they're going to have to answer to the questions below. So you, right off the bat, you, you throw in the, in the process. You don't walk in and say that they have the authority to do this. At least this says that you don't know if they do because they haven't put together the right things. They're putting together things that don't that are anomalous to what you find out later may not even be their right to do against a certain class of people. And who are are who is that agency but the agent of the grantor to all your land and that is that's conveyed and, and granted in the United States of America by patent, whether that be federal or state, because there's state certifications of patent as well. But those were given by authority of the of the of the Congress or by the statehood. And you just have to read all. You have to read all this stuff. You have to be knowledgeable of these things, not what you think you see on the internet, not someone's opinion. So, right off the bat, the standard is meaningfulness. You throw it in their face. I have no meaningful opportunity. I see some confusion here in your own notice. It doesn't meet the standard of a notice to be disclosing objective and giving me disclosure of the things that need to be in a thing you have to that you have authority to do. So I, I hope if you're following the process, it's not that hard. Now, there's a lot more that happens. You've got to go to Title V for the United States of America and the APA. You have this in your state laws. It's the Administrative Procedures Act. You want to read through that. Yeah, it's kind of dry and boring, but you'll understand that some principles in there that are real simple. You just measure, remember those principles, and that'll make it into every everything you do. I told you this is not much different than what we did in the mining rule and the mining law regulations, where we attacked the sufficiency of notice, where they said they thought they, where they were imp implying, they were uh, pur purporting to be able to regulate a mineral estate that's granted to private people. That creates a private inholding. Now, how does a federal agency have the right on the surface of that to make a notice that they say that they can interfere? That we're not engaging that notice. We're saying that that presentation, that representation, is a fraud. And that's what this letter starts to do. But it doesn't just do it like I've told you. This letter doesn't just say, I think I'm confused and shut up. No, it lists things that made no sense, and they literally make no sense to exist, so that you couldn't be confused. And so the response ought to be to answer those by the, by the agency. And this is where you have to learn, I would say, go back, go look at some other FDA in this case, look at the specific uh, agency, not just any general one. Look and specifically see how they deal with these. Look for your questions in prior comment periods and see how they deal with them so that you can see where they might go. In other words, this is how you do your research to anticipate the future of where they might go. When you do that, you can anticipate what you need to say. So you, it comes out of you really fast. You already know what to say when they go there. If they don't and they answer you, well, then that's it. You get to go with what the answer is and, and you appear to qualify that it's the right answer. And they explain something maybe we, that you didn't understand at that point. That's fine. It's okay to be educated as you go. But to not question it and let them slip by, that's a, that's a cardinal sin as far as I can tell. And they've got lots of those flying right now, and we're, 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 we're having to deal with the devil over that right now because of it. So we put in now, not just that I'm confused, not just that something's not making, not just that it doesn't represent it, not that it's not just meaningful. Once you make those statements, as I've told you, just go look at the rules of evidence. That's an objection. You have to have a reason. You have to state, I object. Let's go back to Perry Mason, those of you that are uh, likely wanting to use the cannabis for some health issue. Perry Mason said, I object, and then what they would do? 
they gave a rule of evidence why the objections were solid and then supported that if need be, if it wasn't obvious. And so I object, I'm confused, it's not meaningful, this and that. Here's why. And they have to be substantial. Otherwise, what does the judge do? What does the judge do? I overrule you. Right? So in other words, when you hear that, you've made a claim. And he has to overrule that claim. Otherwise, that claim stands. In other words, you made a claim. He just has the power to overrule it. And so the, so you see the dynamic of the court is whoever makes the best claims, actually. And substantiates their thing, their obvious, their position with evidence, and that's what this is. I have evidence of my for my confusion, valid, material, relevant, and pertinent evidence, right in your own notice. Again, I've told you you can use the agencies to fight amongst themselves and to speak against themselves if you understand the subject matter. And so I heard you heard him author author out why the confusion happens. They sound legitimate to me. They sound legitimate within the context of what I have studied. I would like to see the answer to this myself, of these points. Bringing up the act of the psychotropic substance itself, and then showing that this is not this is more voluntary than it is uh, than it is uh, oblig- obligatory. What are you doing when you do that? You're not preparing the fact that even if you if you have authority, you may not really have authority uh, to f- to have to go in a certain direction. But the following paragraph clarifies you may not be able to get the authority at least to certain things. And that happens to be tied to your ground, your land production. And so these, this is not just a confusion. It, it, it can, it's cloud, it's under the cover of a confusion, but it's actually you're stating these are incongruities, anomalies that you haven't reconciled in your notice that make it really a, absurd what you're trying to profess. You haven't, again, as we uh, bring up when we get down a little bit farther, talking to beyond the fact that some countries have stopped even following this thing and now are doing the cannabis. And now I know there's a story they're coming up, I may get to it, about psilocybin. Well, that's a psycho, uh, psychotropic uh, uh, substance that's being changed. Now, I understand the fentanyl will be completely, some, completely uh, synthetic, if I understand that correctly. That's another thing. So they're balanced. So between the notice, you also see a synthetic versus natural. And now psilocybin comes up, which could... It wasn't added to this comment. I suppose it could be. My point is that depends on how much you want to bring to the table. How many pages do you want to say to 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 uh, make create standing to stop this nonsense against something that they truly, in my view, they truly have not looked at this. And I and I truly believe that they believe that they the, the bottom line drives them so much more because they want to monopolize this stuff for the bottom line of their industry. It makes big uh, GDP. Right? It makes big GDP. I don't know what, what else are we going to say about that? That means they're, they have a conflict of interest, don't they? And so, again, I'm driven by the fact I see people being helped. When I see little kids going from seizure, 15-second seizures, I mean, every 15 seconds after the last one, grand mal seizures, and they give this stuff on their tongue, and then within two minutes they're fixed, that's all I needed to see. And then all the other stories piled up. Years ago they started to weigh on me about, what is this thing really? Because again, I'm not, I have no, I'm neither here nor there. It's not something I've, su- I've suggested to myself I need or has been suggested to me that I need. So there's a big lie going on. I, see, I can see a methodology of cover-up to enforce a monopoly on people. And then what do they do? Legalize it, right? Then you've got to go to their doctors and their licensees. And then you've got the Western medicine nonsense. You can't go to your own, you can't go to the nature anymore. The nature they want to protect, they want to keep you from it. At the time of your lives, probably most likely the elder listeners, the elder, I said, elder listeners that are listening to me, when you need it, where are you, folks? Here's, here's one, one commenter right here sending in a letter. I think, again, I'm thrilled. So you attack the fact that even the other countries aren't even recognized. This is a voluntary thing. There's no, no treaty, actually. The Convention on Psychotropic Substances, is that a treaty? No, he says right in the article, this author puts, it's an an international agreement. We can agree to disagree. You want to put it in their context. So there's nothing here, it's like all the sustainable, it's all voluntary, folks. And if you start to identify what I'm saying, you start to see how they're doing it to us, and how easy this thing is to, to, well, lawfully it's quash. I want to do it with a hammer. I want to squash it. We need to take this thing down. 
And then we bring up the what to me is really the heart, the bread and butter for me. When I and this is the, my contribution was to speak to, and this was not my origination. I took what the author started to say, probably coming from what I said on the broadcast, and then I expanded it because the author chose to go there. And I try not to put myself into the documents. I try to expand what you would do if to make better the discussion, more whole the the, the position that I then contributed on the lead of the author, what to say regarding the uh, lack of authority for an agency to supersede, by any agreement, supersede the Constitution's federal law and state law. That was the origination of the statement. Then I bring in how, in words, and this is an instruction as well, if you go through the sentences, and I know they're quite long, but if you go through, these are all qualifiers. And if you go through and make a list of those qualifiers, You'll get to see everything that the agency's going to have to speak to. And if they don't speak meaningful to it, in the law I mean meaningful, but because meaningful is usually just an interpretation on some, some alternative. And that's the process you're in. But you kill the alternative by bringing the law. And you bring out these list of things that are all prerequisite limitations on the authority of the agency. And you move them outside of their contested case condition where they can only determine rights after the fact. And you bring in your property rights that happened antecedent and vested before they even existed. And something they have to look at. Why? Because the Constitution is the limiting document to their delegation of authority. Now you're saying your confusion is the fact in this letter by this author. My confusion is how you even have authority here at all. And here's that objection relative to disposal law, grant law, and obligations of the United States that you are duty-bound to protect. And so this last paragraph kind of rolls up this entire thing. I'm not only confused within the context of what you've done in the notice. I'm confused that you have uh, are claiming any authority at all. And I won't go through the long thing. This document is not going to be posted quite yet. I don't think it's quite made the public record. When you, this thing goes public record, you can find it on the FDA website, I'm sure. And so I, I was given permission to advance this to you all, read it through advance it to y'all and because I'm I was just thrilled that there was an again it doesn't take much to thrill me someone stepped up to respond and I looked at that and I said well this it's kind of interesting when you see something writing and you haven't noticed it before when I saw the word international agreement in this document it reminded me something I jumped over last week when I told you it was international but the provision of the law being international I said man this would affect both sides of the pond this this affect this fraud on on the EU and again the EUN which is typically it's on the United States soil but influences the EU because that's the social socialist fascist hub of the world the global order that's the experiment working its way out people on the on the other side the uh, euro euro side in the European countries who have this this cover over the top of them can actually attack the lack of rationale behind what they're doing there because of the admission of an authority over on the uh, west uh, west uh, west of the pond so there, you can grab this as I as, as this commenter now has standing once you have standing you can go look at all the record and you, when you go to review check it you pull you can now have pull from all comments that you find and that's why I've said this is so powerful if you have a few people that are all in really want to stop this five people can go five different directions come together and then you pass information you don't even have to pass information you all go look at the record because it has to be published and you go see what everybody had said and you all kind of know you're working there to do the same thing you all went and hit different subject matter problems when you go to do the review if you want to stand up at the end and say no i want a judicial review on this this is not a meaningful process the notice is fraud it was a felony whatever it obli- it violated fiduciary breaches it, it was extending beyond the delegated authorities that could be delegated all this stuff you could bring then you start pulling from everybody else who was on point who maybe bat- decided to back off which i don't know why you'd want to but anyway that's what happens i can only deal with the reality of things i can't and, and persistence is not one of our strong suits as people. But some of you will, and that's what I speak to. I speak to those that will, not, not those that won't. And so once you get in, you can then pull from everything else. And everybody else's comment, even one little bits of it that made a lot of sense that they didn't really, you see they didn't respond to. Uh, you can get into this. So what I'm saying, 
uh, here's a, a letter. It's a comment. I think it's totally sufficient. I think it laid some neat uh, foundation. We now wait and see. Uh, I won't. I will wait to see the response. I won't have time to track it. The author has to do this. He will see what the response is. May or may not be able to analyze it. Uh, we'll do some research, hopefully, to get a basis for the analysis. So when they come back and they try to throw it under the rug, that's the point you bring out where they you show exactly your objection is that they threw it under the rug and they weren't supposed to. Then you have to give the reason. You should be able to articulate that reason. Now you have the next step that gets you to the point where you can do the review uh, from a court. And then if you think how this works, you become that all the environmental terrorists that go sue everybody, you start doing that. You're that you become that status, someone checking. They want to call themselves the watchdogs, but you're doing it in a proper way. You're not doing it as the stalking horse or the uh, just the terrorist. You're not doing it to get the sweetheart deal. You don't have that origination. You're pointing out very big systemic failures that no one yet has actually pointed out. And no one persisted against when they tried to give you the, the dumb answer. And so, I don't know how much more to say. You get involved, you start to see this. The more you get engaged, you'll start seeing more. you see how easy it is. This is only a page and uh, not even a page and a half, folks. I don't know how long it took uh, the author to pull it together. I see some study done. Uh, the point was it, uh, it, it may have been leisure time from what I can see going on here. It wasn't too hard to come up with this stuff. A quick perusal of the requirements. Uh, what's the point? What has to happen? And you're looking to make those challenges when you see that they can't or don't or won't. Or, or at this point, you don't have enough information that, that they can show that there is. In fact, in here, I think we uh, bring up, uh, he brings up the, uh, and I can't remember now where it was. I'm, I'm thinking in a different direction. But even so, you would uh, bring up that the information, I thought it was helpful, uh, what was it, helpful, uh, that the information, but for some fraud, but for some misinformation, is it, it makes it a problem. That's a declaration of fraud. They've got to fix They've got to tell you how what they've done is not fraudulent. They have to then say how the stuff that they aren't looking at that now is current that they're not looking at was interpreted. So you have an administrative process inside the process. And that's the stuff you go after. And I know it maybe sounds a little complicated, but once you see what you're after, it's like it's like your target. I don't know if anybody of you all this hunted. That's what it is. When you you identify the your your prey, uh, you now direct the focus to that. That's all. It's not that difficult. The way we think about all this stuff is so ab abstract. It gets all overwhelming to us. But if if let's say they went through and they answered. Three out of four of the points made by this poster, that fourth one, let's just give it to them without argument, that fourth one is, is it kills them. It's the stake in the heart, if they miss a substantial point, like, let's say, point, now, let's say they can't answer to point four, number four. They, they can't answer how the vested rights are supposed to be recognized, how the DEA doesn't have the right to make hemp uh, or the, prods, the, pro, the, um, the products of hemp, which include CBD, they have no authority to make that illegal. Because those with land in the United States were not reserved from creating it. In fact, as I said before, it was a utility product, the hemp was. That you have now found some new minerals, if you will, some new products. It was with it. it well, let me give the word that no one seems to understand. I see it everywhere. It's astonishing, shocking. It's a pertinent, a pertinent to the grants. And as I saw it say that, I was talking with the Rancho 42. We're going through a, pro a problem with another property owner. And we're going through some of the dialogue uh, or the, the prop the, um, how did the how did the property owner claim the minerals. you got to go through the documents. You go read the document for the homestead uh, patent that, uh, that Rancho 42 produced. Uh, we we're doing this on Twitter. And you can read. It says a pertinence. Now, why people don't use that word and don't understand what it is, is astonishing to me. But there's things outside of what you're granted. And where they say there's no implication in a grant, the things appurtenant the property can be implicated. And I know that sounds confusing, but it's not. When you start sitting down and figuring out, uh, let's say if a thing's not granted, you have no appurtenance. Things that are granted, you have things surrounding that that support it. You may know those now today. They've uh, adjusted those to, to put some control on them that they, is wrongful as well. It may call them the bundle of rights. 
I, I've never agreed with the way that's been characterized. I think it's a mischaracterization. It doesn't list. It doesn't uh, give an idea that you have a right. It looks like they know what those bundles of rights are. And in fact, they don't, they're not in that business when you get into the Supreme Court or the appellate courts because they're just reviewing whether the process below was correct, s- compliant with due process. So be careful on what we hear here, but I don't think it's a bundle of rights. No, these are, I speak in, and you should speak, not in code. You speak right out of the documents of evidence. In this case, for this problem, uh, with the, what I think is a problem for the FDA or the DEA or an agreement that agrees with the UN on uh, illegalizing anything having to do with cannabis and then misappro, I mean, misstating it as a psychotropic with a with a a natural psychotropic that they're finding all kinds of use for with a synthetic that they're finding all kinds of damage from. You bring on the natural process of it's being produced from the land where your wealth is, wealth in health, wealth in funds, wealth in lifestyle, wealth in society. You look at what comes from the land, the law of the land is the law of society. Now they don't have a right to interfere with that. And it's up to you to assert that because they don't care. And you could not care, and then I don't know what your gripe is. But anyway, I'm not sure where to go with this more than to explain. We have one more commenter out there, one more potential to fight uh, the cannabis. We probably need five to ten people uh, out there because there's so many different points. And just to come together to show that the FDA is out of its element. It may be deferred. It may be an expert to be a lawmaker administratively, but it's out of its element. It's out of its delegation of authority, actually. It's breaching the fiduciary of the grand tour, which is its, its master. As the comment comes through, an uh, interesting uh, observation someone made. We've heard the term sovereign citizen, and someone pointed out to a cop. He said, no, you're the, you, not me. You are the sovereign's citizen. I thought that was brilliant. Simple little addition of a possessive in language, and you change the whole context of what's going on. Now, I don't know what happened to that guy maybe doing the filming in a First Amendment audit. I don't remember. I was just told the story. The point is, when you think very critically, if you learn really how to think critically instead of stop talking about how critically everyone you think and how everyone's supposed to think, you start actually doing this. Or trying, I mean, doing your best to do it. I don't know how well I do sometimes, but I'm always questioning that. But I think I do pretty well to look at stuff. That was a critical observation on a very, very serious point that this is applicable to these things. Where did you, this agency get the authority when the, the property, and I'll go back to this very important point, when a grant of the United States of land to a, a man or woman is forever and precludes and is exclusive to that man or woman, even as against the whole world, including the grantor themselves. It's Fletcher versus Peck 1810 will explain. The legislature can even do a law wrong, but if it grants something, the the judiciary cannot touch the will of a grantor. It has this, the grantor is a stop from going back, and this was, a I think, Georgia, the legislature of Georgia went back after a next session to try and undo what the prior session had did, and the court said, you can't do that. The grantor did it. The, the, the grant is done. You, you're a stop from going back to mess with that grant. How much less of an authority is an agent of that grantor relative to a, as I would, as I will, I have here, help to show it's a production right appurtenant, the grant of the land for use. In particular, a homestead, a homestead entry, which was all agriculture. And so you start learning the underpinnings of this. And our, your, I can't, can't see how your thought process doesn't, doesn't change. Your thought processes don't change, and you start approaching it really more, more grounded, more really to the point. And you don't get all frothy about it. You just start looking. Okay, these guys are going down this road. That was really some place they can't go. And here's how. And you articulate. You learn. You sit back. You calm down, and you say, "This is how." And I'm kind of excited about the letter. This letter, a couple, couple simple points. And it says, well, you bring up this term, but it's not applicable to this thing. And I think that's a critical insight because that exposes something else, and I think it exposes the underlying reason they couldn't, what is what I'm just saying now about the production right. What they do is they get you to believe they could. 
This is how sustainable development comes. This is like smart cities. All this nonsense is a suggestion. Voluntary. If they had the right, they wouldn't ask you. That's another point. And they're they're uh, and I think this might be an honest in, at least an honest intent that maybe we as we go on we may not know all this stuff. Those we just have to pay attention and there's going to be an encroachment. Those are being encroached. They shouldn't have to be encroached. In fact, it's a violation to them that they are. But in fact, accidents happen and we'd rather make a provision so that we can at least eliminate some. And this is one of those administrate why this administrative procedure happens. And you have a point now. You want to gripe about how you're being run down. I'm saying this is the pro- the process by which you explain to them they, they are running you down and they don't have the right. And I can't tell you what all you could use, but there's your mechanism. There's the way to solve some of this stuff. You change the ability, you alter, you show the policy can't extend to certain areas that it has been. Those are all at least fiduciary breaches or just a maladministration. They're no, they're a malfeasance if they start to cra- creep into the criminal side. Nonfeasance, you fail to act to protect the grant. That's the obligation of the protection. It's a warrant of the guarantee of the patent, folks. This is all basic property law. And as I say, I'll say it again. I haven't said it for a long time. If you don't know about property, you probably is property. And if you don't stand up against the uh, invasion or trespass of your property, whether it's official or, or naked trespass, you are trespassed and have been agreeable to it. Do you think I like to hear that? I don't. I want to be at peace. This is not a peaceful setup. But the law was to bring peace. And it was supposed to set an objective basis that we're supposed to uh, follow. The, those are all being thrown down. And it's because no one steps up to insert them back. And I, I, again, I don't know where this is going to go. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how they respond. We'll see what happens here. But I find it interesting. How are they going to, when you hold the property against the whole world and there was no reservation against the growing of a plant, how, how are they going to justify the invasion? And as we say here again, you heard the words as I read it before. We threw in the fact that it's a viol- third party without and when they do author- when they bring an authority that's not warranted, it is those felonies, multiple felonies, fiduciary breach by the grantor's federal agency. There's the extortion, coercion, and conversion statutes I'm talking to you about all the time in one simple little part clause to part number four. So in just a few words, you bring in the totality of the penal code. Now, there's some other side on the federal. There's some in the federal side as well, but there, if you speak local to you, your, your state laws is what comes into bear here first. And I've told you before, to get an agent of the federal government, you have to show that they violated a clearly established law at the state level first. Now, what I've told you I've done is that you set it up to the point that you know the process, so you know that the to get that uh, state of, the federal official, federal official off, the attorney general or the local proce- federal prosecutor has to certify that that uh, a employee or officer was within the scope of their duties. You make it so that they, when they make that statement, they have, the, the prosecutor themselves has falsely testified, falsely certified. You bring them into it as well. And so there's when you think this through, like you would think this process of this administrative process, I told you you set the future out in your document before you write the document, and then you speak to that future in the document, and you set it up. And if they don't address all this, like number four, all these comma, 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 they don't address everything that's between the commas as an independent thing, they have not responded meaningfully to this, and that opens them up to your review. And if it sits in the law, it's defense, indefensible what they've done. And so, yes, you have to have a, it's just a little bit of a steep learning curve, but once you learn the process, like I, what did we do? I, have, I had him add the entry of the this dialogue. I had him add because of safety concerns, I want my information withheld. Did you know you could do that? Now, there's a certain limit to it, but most of your information for personal safety, you're, for a reason, again, there's a reason there to withhold your private information from a public system. Why did they even have to do that? When you start understanding the dynamic, you start seeing that the, it's there. So if you don't put that in, they put your name in the public sector. If you do put that in, they won't. 
It's the same thing like a FOIA, F-O-I-A, Freedom of Information Act request. You, you want to ask for a waiver of fees, you have to give them a reason. And one of the reasons, if you go to the waiver, there's like three or four, if I remember, it, maybe five, I don't know. can't remember all these, uh, that depth, but I only use the ones I need, so those are the ones that stay in my memory. All you have to do is give them the reason why, and that reason's given in the statute. And the main reason is, you really can't charge me fees because I'm going to use this in, uh, as a, um, to further a remedy to, for harm done to me. No, they, they can't charge you now. But, I mean, you better, you better not be caught lying about that. But the point is, is that that's one of the ways you waive the fees. There's got to be a re Again, you make a request, there's got to be a reason. You make an objection, there's got to be a valid reason. And so this is a, when they, there's a provision in the Amer Administrative Procedures Act, that if you don't want to be known to, to the most part about who you are making it, your comment becomes anonymous. They know who did it. They just don't publicize it. You put that in the document, they can't publicize. If they do, what does that mean? It means that maybe they're trying to intimidate you, right? Could be a mistake, but that's not the law, is it? Now, you may have to show that that may have caused some harm upon you, the point is that there's a checks and balances about a lot of this stuff. There's things you can do. You just have to read for them and make a short list of the things you need. And that's what I was telling the author. There's things that you put in. You just learn what they are. You just throw them in the letters. I don't do anything with a FOIA that's not probably going to be, well, none of them have gone that I've ever done a FOIA. It was not going to be, potentially, because we don't know what the information will be, was not going to be used for a lawsuit. And so that clause, that, that paragraph, goes into every FOIA I write. It's not even a question. I copy and paste it from one place to the next because I would make a form letter on the on these rules. I lay it out, and if I need it, I go look through the list. What do I need for this letter? I just copy it over. Copy and paste is pretty cool, folks. For someone who can't type, that's pretty. That's just talk about a talk about better than sliced white bread. And so I guess I guess my point, my experience is, when you get yourself ordered up, it's not that hard to kick out a letter. Okay, there's a little bit of run-up on the learning, but once you get that, like anything, once you establish the, you got your storefront set up and you got the store shelves stocked, now you open the door. Only this this door you're opening it happens to be a very particularized letter writing campaign for in this in this example, and the persistence to manage that case that you've started essentially. And I'm not saying that the agency can't answer to this. Maybe they can. I didn't even analyze it. Much more, but I looked at this these points, four points, folks, just four points, a couple subparts, a page and a half. I thought it was pretty formidable. I almost I got a smile on my face. This is kind of kind of cool, isn't that neat to see it? See, so I don't I don't write it, so I don't get to see it, but now I got to see it. So thank you to the author to make me smile a bit. We may have a, an ability, given the persistence, to just press against it if nothing else. I, I, it's going to be a little bit of a work, but like any of this stuff is. And maybe more will come. Hopefully, maybe I'll inspire some of you all that are thinking about doing something. If cannabis, uh, this fraud on cannabis and the harm that it's causing millions and millions of people is causing because of this this type of a fraud and how they present it, it's nothing to jump in, folks. Nothing. Now, I don't know if, I think the date is over. I think there was the 15th, so you can't jump in on this one. Uh, and then in that regard, I don't know that that's the case. We, I think you can still send in a, a, a notice, and if your if your cause is a uh, is that good, they can't disregard it. Is another interesting point, but you just have to know that part. And I I suspect the answer. I have a suspicion, though I don't know. Depending on how who reads this, depending on how uh, in, intimate they are with their obligations, this type of a one letter could cause a, at least a delay to extend the time of comment while they do the analysis on how they're going to go and answer to this, knowing if it's substantial enough, they cannot survive a judicial review. In other words, what about that fiduciary relationship and duty? What about, and see, we haven't talked about it here, and he didn't need to, but the, the ramifications of talking about the constitutional violation, remember, the patent exposes, or your land deeds, relevant to a patent, expose the government's contract to convey that land to someone. So you, any if there's no reservation, the contract said there was no reservation, and now you're starting to take authority to, to encroach upon something that wasn't reserved. That's an impairment of contract. It's the impairment of the obligation on the grantor side. 
you got them in a constitutional problem. We didn't mention it. There was no need to mention it here. You'll mention it later. You want to hold something back. You just, in the word constitution, you got all these principles going to become flying at them if they go the wrong way. I've told you, it's like a, a kernel, a popcorn kernel. This paper is a popcorn kernel. It'll explode on them if they try to, if they, if they heat, if they get too hot on what they think their authority is, you're, this is going to explode on them. And you have to be prepared to be that, ex, explain the explosion. So we get into the constitutional violations, we get into the obligations of contract, we get into the, the failure now that if the Congress is supposed to be supreme, the supremacy clause in its disposals, how did the agency come to diminish that? There's another one. How about a law coming later? And this is only an agreement, international agreement, that's not supposed to infringe. It cannot infringe on that constitution. It's impairing the con obligation of contract, then it does also. It's a, it's a, since agency makes law by rule, because that's what the Supreme Court claims, isn't it an ex post facto law that they're prohibited from issuing? I think it is. We can argue about it, but I think it is. That's what I would go. And so we have in this the kernel that explodes on them if they don't address this right. That brings up what? It brings up the limitations, like we're told the Constitution is, upon agent, a government action. In this case, an agency. And if you look carefully at agency authority, and in particular in the states it's much clearer, under contested cases, and this is, I don't know if this rises to that level, but it gives us a modicum of idea where the agency's authority is. You look carefully, it says that the agency hearing for contested cases, is the authority to the hearings officer is only pursuant to some paper that was issued by them, their, their authority, by the authority that they sit over, and, and determines rights after that issuance. So if we can look at that not as a hard and fast rule, but as a general soft rule, we're back to that relation back doctrine in your patent. How did an agency that didn't exist at all, well, your rights are vested back relating back to oh, maybe 50, 70, 100 years back. How did it have authority to interfere and determine rights after that grant when by the very nature of the grant it says forever this thing is valid? How are they having authority there at all? You're now looking at your the empowerment of that constitution no one wants to see. But you're doing it in an administrative side. You had, and you, had, you did it by attacking the administrative sufficiency, and then you gave a comment that may have a whole bunch of stuff in it that you just spoke in short terms. You think I did a lot of claw, comma, comma, comma sentences with long statement, never ending the end, never coming to the end, and I told you, but those are all elements of the prohibition. Each one has to be answered to. Now, if you do it another way, you have to make each one of those a sentence. This paper gets really, really long. But in this case, the administrative procedures only tells them you give them notice, opportunity to respond, to give them notice of where it may not be correct what they're doing. They have the power to decide that. But if that power is outside their constraints to do so, if they try to make a decision that determines rights after they've been vested, where they have had no authority in the first place on the delegation of its own creation, but couldn't because the grantor couldn't, on the fiduciary side of the grant. You, I don't know where else they go, folks. Now, you want to protect your property, then what do you do? They're going to go against it, you do the review. If it goes south, you go to injunction. At least you have a play, folks. No, you're not griping in a chat room. And again, I was kind of fascinated. I always like this, the, the duality of the problem for the government when you have them saying one thing on official record and you look across to a whole different jurisdiction and you say, well, they're mistreating it in the same fraud, then everybody over there can take the acknowledgement of this fraud. In other words, if you're the first one to bring the argument, you can give notice to everybody and they go, oh, yeah, we didn't think of it that way. And they start using it there. And what we do on this case, if I just look at the surfaces, you pry the cannabis away from the psychotropic part, the, the synthetic psychotropic part, where at least in the United States they have no right because they couldn't interfere with the production. Or it's just fraudulent, their connection and, and their denials of their own medicinal determination, which is another point the article, the author makes. You've already decided it has some, some medicinal value. And I just saw another thing. Maybe I should move there now. I think I will. Uh, maybe I'll move there right now, but I'm going to have to adjust something. 
Let's move from here to that, where the psychotropics in the mushroom, they're, they're actually calling, and you get, so I didn't, so I, again, I don't know a lot of this. I mean, I pick some of this up that I'm not interested in. I may not be interested to pursue it and study it, but I pick it up as I read. They're making the determination, and I don't agree with this for cannabis, but they're, they're showing us that even in the shrooms, what they call the shrooms, they're going to then re reschedule it to a Schedule 5. And so we now see a mechanism that, for something that I would have thought would have been so far out of line to do so. They're already willing to move a reschedule of mushrooms up to Schedule 5, which is what I got out of this story. Shroom, for improvement, FDA lists psychedelic drugs as breakthrough therapy for depression. Well, I wonder if that psycho psychotropic international agreement has to do with psychedelics as well. And how is fentanyl that anyway? But anyway, so let's get not lose, lose sight. Uh, this is, in a way, an exciting... Uh, I just love, just love seeing even one of you step up and do something a uh, page and a half. Uh, I, I, I hope it persists. And w we have now an addressment that we can make that anybody else that wants to jump in can also do in all these areas. And I think it's going to take this right now while we figure out how we go about addressing the oppression and the the unaccountable extensions of, of authority. And now I do I do come through that law of the land side, but I don't mean the Constitution, Article Six. I'm talking about the literal land and the grants and the grant law and the fiduciary obligations. And you have the uh, statuses and relationships, the trustees, the beneficiary, and then the exclusiveness against even the grant, ultimately in the patents or any conveyance document. All these come to bear if you bring it. But if you don't, they run it down. And the Bar Association runs all through this, and they go, where appropriate, remember? Sustainable development. But getting over, we now see that there's a mechanism, the shrooms for improvement, speaking a bit not to what they mentioned there in that, in that ad. I suppose I didn't see psilocybin in that list, but I didn't know that it wasn't psychotropic, these mushrooms that the FDA also comes out as some kind of conundrum upon their own authority. Oh, well, well, these things are therapy. These things are actually medicinal. They have a meaning. Well, Schedule 5, if I understand it, it still has to go through a doctor for prescription. And the other thing, I guess, is one of the standards is that it's not addictive, and they're finding out this, uh, these natural substances aren't addictive that way. And so that was an important statement to make as well. But again, it depends on how deep you want to go. You can always make that once you broach the ideas. But if you don't broach the ideas... I don't know what to say. You're a cricket. You're you're a, you're a, you're part of the problem. I mean, and I know people don't want to hear that, but that's that, that's the fact. Wherever there's a problem, you witness a crime somewhere, and you're not stepping up to witness it. That's part of how we keep society pleasant: is to stop the crime around us, and don't be, don't be bashful about stepping up. And I mean, you may take a certain way to do that, but don't step don't be bashful about stepping up to stop a crime. Call it out. Be one of the many that should be there to call it out. And if you show up, maybe the next guy shows up, and the next guy, and the woman, uh, you know, always got to do this gender-neutral stuff. At any rate, I'm talking about y'all. Boy, don't let's not go down that. You know how long it would take to go through all those cl 100 classifications now of all this nonsense? But at any rate, oh, y'all, you listeners, you can be quiet as crickets and let this stuff go on, or read as I do the notice in, in these things, these stories that tell us Oh, that's how that all worked if we didn't have a clue. And I'm telling you right now, I don't know about the scheduling much more than know it's there. And here I see that they have the choice to do so, and they're going to move psilocybin from a, a Schedule 1 down to Schedule 5 where it can now be used as a therapy. Now, I wonder what, that seems arbitrary and capricious to me. It's a natural substance could produce from the land just as easily as your hemp or any other plant. This is ripe for attack as well. And yet, listen to how they, they, they describe this, how breaking, uh, breathtaking this is in its, in its uh, importance, is why I guess I'm kind of looking at this as well. They're going to ask about cannabis on the international scope, and we have one commenter going to put something in, and I, I hope there's other ones that are just not talking to me, but there's one I know about. And now, putting the tip of the spear at the throat of the FDA, saying, okay, stop the nonsense, you need to go in a different way. You you can't go as far as you are. Don't come and don't invade my land, and don't don't invade the law, and don't disrespect Congress in its disposals. 
don't talk out of both sides of your mouth. And don't misinterpret the terms to benefit something we don't understand, nor we may or know or know not. Similarly here, psilocybin is a therapy. It's natural. Stop. It's not addictive. Stop the regulation. Stop the control. Stop the decriminalization. Stop the legalization. Once it found to be natural and it didn't kill people. Well, let's put it this way, folks. Do you think, or why do you think a death cap isn't put on Schedule 1? It's a mushroom that you eat it and you're dead. Or at least, uh, I think you're dead. Absolutely. I was going to say, maybe you're just harmed really, really, really bad. You should be dead. But you're dead. A death cap will kill you. Why isn't that Schedule 1? People eat them all the time and die. But see, this is the stupidity behind the arbitrary and capricious nature of this. And that's why we, I really, part of my idea here is we gotta, we got to rest back the production of the land. That includes all the plants and animals and all that. Back to our, I want to call it stewardship, our control of possession and use, private. And remember, we speak in those grand grants, land grants are production, not commerce. And that's where you look international. I forgot to mention that. The, the comment speaks to something impliedly that's not ex, ex, um, that is not spoken to that the jurisdiction for the federal agency going international is in commerce solely. And, and impliedly in the notice, there, there has to be a commercial connection. They don't have a savings clause saying it doesn't pertain to, not, to private use, which I've been telling you is how they've been doing it to us, like in all the, all the drug laws. They have to tie five, four or five elements of commerce, like the scales, the packages, uh, well, they got the intent. You have to have the intent and the knowing. Uh, then you have a, uh, a, 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 a great amount. They want to call whatever the amount is. They give you a small amount, and then everything above that statutorily a, 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 a commerce, a, a drug pusher in commerce. Remember, impliedly in the international, if not, if not expressly, the only real re regulation and agreement authority across the, across the world internationally from the District of Columbia, which is the proper look, the outlook is the proper way, not the in look. Inlook is supposed to be make regular. Outlook is to protect the interests of the United States. Is in commerce solely. And so that's why if you saw, if you listened, uh, you heard, I'm sure you're listening, you heard inside the document, we said, uh, or there was said there, I think he said, the uh, there was no saving provisions. And that showed the intent to encroach. And why do we know that? It's because... I don't know of anywhere that we didn't need some kind of even legalization to release the boot, the jack boot off of everybody's neck for even growing this stuff in the United States. So the presumption is everybody's in commerce. And that was done also. That's another fraud court case back in 38. And, and I've told you about that. That's the wheat case in 1930. I don't know the parties. The Supreme Court said that the wheat man's production was subject to congressional commerce authority because it, effect, it, it could affect the, uh, the market by his using his own wheat. Complete nonsense. But remember, that was the administrative imposition starting right there in 38. That was when the, when the Supreme Court got packed by Roosevelt. And then a few years later, you got, the, you got all the 1946 Act, which brought all the agencies, or at least the sub substance of the administrative, uh, administrative hammer out. And so, psychedelic drugs are now a breakthrough therapy. Remember, I told you these Initial or these um, acknowledgments of newness or rareness is, is something you focus on. It's really important. This one to me is important, but okay, so what? It's important. I always ask you, how do you apply it? And I'm, I've just suggested prior to that observation how you're going to apply that. Even in psychotropic mushrooms, they're making them therapies. None of which are these, th these natural things are addictive in their own. It's really the synthesizing of more concentrated forms which I suppose the extracts could be, but those, are not, those aren't uh, addictive either uh, through the cannabis that I know of. I've never heard of it. And a CBD that has no response other than a healthful response couldn't. Uh, well, other than you want to be healthy. And so that's a, that's a definition on its own about how the government wants to harm you. But let's read the first paragraph at least here. Uh, psil uh, psychedelic drug researchers can now begin providing psychiatric patients with psilocybin. The active ingredient in magic mushrooms, 
as part of their therapy in a landmark approval by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, okay, I, I want to read. And I, I want to read, and I don't want to read. The first paragraph tells me all I need to know to lock it into the other to the uh, the uh, author's comment to the international review of an international agreement regarding psychotropics. This also shows you that the psychotropics or the uh, the psilocybin is used. They tell you what they're using it for in their legal in their legal medical system. And it's in the concentrated form. And so you have a delineation you can make for those of you that want to. I guess I look at this. I'm not even include I don't I'm not in mushrooms either. All that stuff just never appealed to me. I had no no drive. I thought about it, thought maybe it'd give me higher enlightenment and whatever. Uh, apparently I don't want to be higher enlightened. It doesn't matter. I didn't go that direction. But I'm intrigued more. This comes out, it's like when I was a kid. Oh, there's no water in the universe. I said, wait a minute, how do you have no water in the universe? You just told me that if I have an oxygen and I have a hydrogen and I have an electrical pulse and I have a neutron and I have all kinds of energy coming into this mixture, I'm going to make water. How is there no water in the universe? Oh, go away. You're not, you know, shut up. No, it doesn't work that way. What? And now we hear there's, there's water in the universe. Is why I'm interested in this. What more lies will there be? The problem for me is that I don't have all the world and the life left over to do this. I see this as a, a way to get back to the land again, get back to our society, get back to being left alone. And, uh, and this is not my subject matter of expertise, but I see within this the seed, the germ. I don't want to be a wayfarer. The germ infecting society. You could be that. Those of you that are really interested would have a bigger drive. Me, it's, I'm looking at this. Whoa, what non arbitrary and capricious nonsense has this been before that they're not continuing on other things, that I'm going to use this against other stuff? Should be the way you're thinking. I say should. I know it's advised that I don't tell anybody anything. But, again, do you want to be a cricket? Do you want to be a hermit? Do you want to, be, uh, do you want to get hermit till they show up and step on your rock? Flash grenade you out of your cave? I mean, it's... That's where this goes. It's because I just haven't seen. I went to the. I went to the forest. They. I told you they sought me out. And I said, "Well, that ain't gonna work." Now what? And so we're here today, coming up with all this oddball stuff. No one ever thought to do. It's all of us ours to do. And I'm really disappointed. I don't hear more. That's why it thrills me. One of you just thrills me to death. And I, again, thank you very much. I don't know where that's gonna go, but thank you very much. So. Psychedelics are now therapy. What, what happened to cannabis? Why does it become such a big deal uh, then? It's a and again, it's a natural plant. Where was the authority to stop a natural plant on top of that? Now, the courts may have had different decisions. You have to look at those court cases, and you have to figure out the path that avoids all of that and asserts a better word. Like I said, the wheat case, I, I read the wheat case. They did not assert, assert the estoppel against the federal government. They did not assert the estoppel against that grant. And the, and the Supreme Court has no jurisdiction to cite it. In other words, that's an injunction. Direct up, they don't have the authority to even bring the case. So, what have I said there? A ton, but I won't go there today. I talk about it all the time. It's not that hard to figure out once you see it, where to go. Uh, our problem's going to be the Bar Association and the seats of decision, and then we go to matters of law and how those work, and the only thing I can see there is after a while, there's so many people that are doing the law that the legal's not keeping up with that they become irrelevant. And we come to a point where we start to do what this next guy said, and I'm shifting gears a bit. Uh, we were talking before, again, and these are like Monsatan and uh, Slayer uh, now, relative to the Monsatan's uh, verdict against them, uh, that the judge was not was going to take away the punitive damages and that the uh, they were going to. He was going to. She. She was going to reduce the uh, the reward, the compensation reward. Uh, it now comes out that the judge had second thoughts. But the point is, is why the judge upholds the on Satan verdict, but cuts awards to seventy eight uh, to seventy eight million dollars. So here's a bar member sitting in the seat of decision, the final act behind this. But the, but remember, there's checks and balances if you'd only assert them. And this is what I look for. I see this. Not that I look for them. They just they just apparent when you read the re reports. You just see the. If you know what you what to you know to look for them, they're there. 
Why would the, before the judge report that they were going to cut out the punitive, which she said she couldn't prove, the malice wasn't an element. And I told you that, well, that shows you that you need, as a someone who's doing like a prosecution, make sure your elements are there. Make sure they're proven on the record. Make sure there's evidence for them. Uh, in this case, I'm only reading from the service. Didn't know if that was the fact or not, but it's interesting. She comes back and she will, she upholds the verdict and the punitive, but reduces them. Now, that's an interesting problem also. But what what is she supposed to be maintaining as well as the law on in these in these matters of how they uh, try to figure out what they can take and what they what makes it appropriate for you to agree with the the, the those that they're trying to keep the natives they're trying to keep from getting restless. What is that thing that they have to keep in you? Do I have anybody that's thinking about what do they have to keep? What, what do they try and gain from you? Another word for it is trust. There's a different word. It's in our money system. They use the same word over and over. So they've re- this judge reduces the Monsanto reward, does not cut out the punitive, but reduces it by a bunch. She then she says that the jury award wasn't worthy of 278 million, but only maybe 39 million, and the damages to the man who got cancer from Monsanto and their non-disclosure. Remember, all they had to do was put the fact that they could it would cause cancer on the label, and they would he wouldn't have had a cause. That's how simple this this uh, razor blade edge is. Uh, that she reduced his damages by I think a couple million, 35 million or something. No, it's irrelevant. She unilaterally reduced the damages. That keeps the bottom line up, doesn't it? But more importantly was this statement. Why didn't she actually stop the punitive that she claimed was no malice? Let's read down, way down to the bottom. Some jurors were so upset by the prospect prospect of having their verdict thrown out that they wrote to Balanos, the judge, and one party juror said, quote, I urge you to respect and honor our verdict and the six weeks of our lives that we dedicated to this trial, juror Gary Katathata wrote. Juror Robert Howard said that the jury paid, quote, studious attention to the evidence and that any decision to overturn its verdict would shake its confidence in the judicial system shake its confidence in the judicial system. A record made by writing a letter of the very thing that judicial system is not supposed to shake is your mere confidence that they're doing okay, that they just appear to do justice. And I want to point out something that was a failure in the letter. I commend the letters. I commend the statement. Honor our verdict or the jury. What didn't they say? They said, honor our verdict. They didn't say honor our valuation of the harm done or the damages too. And so the judge took advantage of that, didn't she? However, the point, and so you only get the things you assert. The jurors were only of uh, value, they only had value in their own verdict. They didn't have the value in the value that they said the verdict harm uh, or punitive damages would cause. And the judge took advantage of that. But it took a letter writing from a juror, someone was standing, to demand that the verdict be recognized. And guess what? It was. And so those of you that aren't participating, where you can, where you see an injustice, where you don't stand up against an oppressor that acts against you anyway, immediately respond with the principle, why? And on a point that they are open record are required to respond to, like this thing called confidence, it doesn't happen until you do that. It doesn't happen. And, they, and then when it doesn't happen, they do other things just like it. So st- you cannot write a comment, and you're going to be dealt with. I suspect had the no one stepped up in the jury to say, hey, we don't believe what you're doing is correct, just like these folks did. That, that punitive damage would have been kicked out. And then the, the damage, the harm, would have been kicked down. Maybe even farther. In other words, it looks to me like the judge was testing. 
that these jurors understand their power and their rights. And maybe they did, and maybe they didn't. They do enough to say, hold up, honor our verdict. What they didn't understand is that there's two parts to that. The, the verdict of uh, where they get there, and then the damages for that. And you see that the judge took advantage of that. In my estimation, you can see it a bit different, I suppose. But the point for me is you to see, when you read these articles, there are mechanisms, there's dynamics going on, and the system adjusts itself to where everybody would be comfortable. That's that consensus nonsense model. Everybody, we're not made, or, or very few say anything. We're going to go right to there. We're going to ta- encroach right to there. In this case, they encroached on the value. Oh, they gave them their verdict, but they didn't hold up to the will of the verdict value against the, uh, the wrongdoer. Now, I suppose it can be all appealed and all. I don't know. I'm just talking for us. When we look at news and the notice, what's it telling us? To me, this is fantastic to see, again, in, a, in an anecdotal way, confidence is what they keep. And when someone stepped up to say, and that's not the only thing they keep. As I said, they got fiduciary duties and all. But in this case, the confidence in the system was what that occupier tells itself to make sure to do. Because under international law, it can't be found out because it knows under international law, it will be kicked out. And that's another type of job we have. Why I talk about it this way, so hopefully maybe we'll get enough people to start pushing the right pressures to get this thing kicked out. When you read a state law that says that the House delegates of the Bar Association are in the system of your state, well, I don't. I was thinking. I was going to say what it should do. I don't know what it's going to do. When you find out that the House delegates of an organization, a private organization, is in your state as a state agency, that should flip you out. For all you constitutionalists, all you people that believe in the constitution, all you believe that the constitution is imposed upon this government, you're just reading the fact that it no longer does. This is what I've been telling you. And so there's a standard that's met now. It's not to do justice, it's to just resolve to justice. And that means wherever st- the point where people stop complaining. And the people who stopped complaining about this verdict was the jurors who said, honor our verdict. And where they didn't speak about the money, that's where the judge went. You're not going to complain about the money, I'm going to take it from there. So, keep being silent when it takes letter. All it takes is a writing in the right way. Upon the proper proper authority, you can't claim an authority you don't have. A peanut gallery view or someone who was in the gallery, the, 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 the witnessing this trial, could say the same thing. Has a little bit less power, but can say the same thing to make the record. And what that does, that's the prairie dog thing. One prairie dog sees a shadow of an eagle. That's the letter writing. I don't think that this is be. You undermine that and you undermine my confidence in your system. The other prairie dogs start looking. You said you saw a shadow? Was it the eagle shadow? Yeah, I think so. Uh Uh-oh. And there are other prairie dogs that set up. No, they're just prairie dogs. But they at least make acknowledgement until they decide, well, I'm not a prairie dog. Wasn't even supposed to be in that condition. Uh, That eagle is dinner. Or that eagle is a, I'm a falconer now, and that eagle's my, my my tool to go get my food. So it's how you ever frame that, and if you don't put up with your foot up for yourself, the eagle comes and takes advantage. You become its prey, and so here we are. Interesting little proofs in the last few stories, Dif- indicators of where this, how this thing functions, even if you didn't understand how it functions, and in that you see, like in the mushrooms, they'll dro- just drop it to, to, to set schedule five in a heartbeat now that it has some medicinal value. Isn't the author of the cannabis statement saying the same thing? So we already see that it should be dropped at least to Schedule 5, and I'm advocating that it can't go, that there's, they can't, it's not a, um, it's not addictive and it is helpful, but it's not concentrated, so it's not even supposed to be on the schedule. You, you don't say that, they, they go to the level of the judge. Well, you want the verdict, that's fine. Now we're going to go. What did I do in the, uh, help in, in that one provision over the land? I said, you can't, uh, you can't go and breach the fiduciary. In other words, I just stole all the power if they're going to recognize it. And that's the question, isn't it? Are they going to, re- is the occupier going to recognize it? Even an occupier has to recognize it, otherwise they're just an absolute international outlaw. And that's why they have to recognize it, because they'll be viewed as an international outlaw. 
And so look what you're broaching when you start to bring this forward. You're, bre you're an agency that's willing to breach the, the, the fiduciary. You make war on the laws of the United States, and you're coming over to, over to Europe and the European Union to talk about that stuff with us? And on the other side, you're saying, why are you listening to those guys who are breaching the fiduciary duties of the people to their people? And so the people on both sides of the pond start doing a tug of war against this supposed well, this authorita. And and you and Europe doesn't even have this power in their land laws. Think about that one, and they get to use it. And part of that gets me excited because I see how quickly this thing could be done. How quickly this thing starts to come around when we get a better thought about what's going on. Moving over, as I pause to give us our thought here, your lack of input causes the system to take advantage where it thinks it can get away with it. And sometimes that can be pretty brutal about what they'll, that they're willing to do. And they come by various authorities, at least implied, as they, they assert to try and give them that authority. And I've talked to you about the fact of the police, the authorities come, and then we got into the war of terror against you and the DHS and then the TSA and they're taking the national security route. That's the toughest one. But I also told you in the way we're going into the world here from you know, years back into now, it'll be a requirement to write everything you thought down in a ordinance or rule that you thought you were protected by in order to get it in the black and white. Because I said they live and die by the black and white. And if it's not in there, they'll make all kinds of excuses. And the courts are going to give it to them because you don't live under law. You live under an occupying force. Uh, to me, the law, as I've said before, and I think I've proved it over and over and over again, Libra Code is much better, a much better guide than anything else I've found to understand what goes on. Well, I've told you that you have to go in, for those of you that want to and can, or even if you don't want to, but think it's a necessity, and this is where this is comes. Uh, and this is a subject matter that got me started in all this. Again, if it hadn't turned out the way it did for me, we, I would not be talking to you today and I'd be long gone 30, something, 30 years or so, or so ago. Uh, same condition that, that I'm going to talk about right now. And so that starts to formulate what we have to do. Again, it's all in writing. You get the black and white set up. I know it doesn't, it's not good. I don't like having to do it. But until we do that, we're going to watch ourselves. We're going to be executed wherever we go because we're not executing our private power to go shut it down. And one of the ways we do that is we get on the record the policies that constrain this occupying force. It's just had lawless psychopath uh, without constraint. It's already an artificial intelligence. We're already enjoying that. But uh, here's a story that just come up. It actually happened in an incident that happened in September. We're just hearing about it now. I did. I had to get an email sent to me. It uh, reminds me of what, not in the same place, but what happened to me some 30 years ago. I had five cops do the same thing. Well, they invented, they invented a charge. And next thing I know, I'm looking at five cops bearing down on me, and I don't know, really know why. And I'm doing what I can to, at the time, what I understood to tell them. But apparently, it was just a, just enough. And uh, we were able to, in a very touch-and-go moment, was able to de-escalate the whole condition in order to have, in other words, I survived it to be here. And that was really started my first court case where I walked into a law library and got help from other people that were in there, which uh, one is still uh, alive today to, and my friend. Uh, the other woman is dead, and I think uh, women handle this stuff different. They actually, I've seen t many women that were my friends in this. Uh, they see the injustice, but uh, somehow they don't handle that very well. Uh, a guy takes this on differently, I think. Uh, I think it has to do with that mama bear syndrome, and I don't know. Don't don't feel offended, women. This is not not an offense. This is not a judgment. This is just the, the reality. But uh, these are two to a, a friend of mine, two friends of mine. One is uh, did one is not with us now, uh, the woman, and uh, walked into the law library, and they explained to me. Hey, you have just a discussion. I don't didn't know them before. But they explained to me how to approach the courts, and that's where I got started and how to understand what to do. It was d from nothing into walking to a law library and being guided a few points on here, go to here, then go to here, and go to here. And this is where you're going to look. And then here's some examples of what we do. And this is what you start to do, uh, how you start to go about it. Well, it, from near death, literally, folks, near death, uh, to attacking what they did as a lie, uh, charging me for a 
for something I couldn't be doing, actually, but they were doing, actually, uh, to nine months later winning my case and then getting the chastising the officer for doing what he did, but nothing more than that was big enough, actually, to have the uh, listen to the judge get angry at the cop for literally setting the whole thing up, and I was able to defend on every point. It got me started in this whole process and why I realize a rec- making a record is so important, whether it's in judicial side or administrative, or even in making a notice to someplace, that it extends now out into the administrative world that these people that are in government need to be constrained by writings, these policies. That this story pops up, uh, just brought it all back home, folks. It's not over. It's not going to be over yet until we step up in society. At any moment, we could walk into a restaurant turn around, have a cop stand in our face, and next, within two minutes, we're dead. Unarmed man shot in the back, killed by cops in a bathroom over a jaywalking stop. Now, that title doesn't even say it. And I just picked this story up. There's, I could have went a three or four more, more uh, three or four more uh, links. I just wanted to get one up. Just research this out. It really takes a little bit of a study here to see what's going on, but a lot of what the government does now is wrapped up in this. You'll find out that the attorney, the prosecuting attorney, came out, and because the grand jury didn't find the cop culpable, she was able to immediately come out and said, I had nothing to do with that decision. That wasn't our decision. The jury made that decision. Well, that's if you look at the system, that's, that's a lie, because she has the presentation to make before a grand jury and I will tell you my experience is the grand jury is set up most of the grand jury is is government people in the capacity of a juror anymore the government grand jury is a tool for the government and we might if you look at the the makeup of that jury as they said in the news I, I think two of them were not so two out of the seven were not the five were government people you're not going to get an outcome problem is here they, caught, they said in the title that this kid uh, was he's a younger guy, I don't know, maybe 40 or something, 30, 30 I don't even know the age. A lot of that's not irrelevant to me. I'm looking at the dynamic. Uh, the video, when you finally get it, which finally the prosecutor turned out, I don't even, I suppose they want to exonerate themselves. It's good for us to watch it. I don't like to watch it, but it's good to watch because I'm, making, I'm taking notes, folks. I'm taking my notes as hard as I can to figure this thing down, or figure out how, how we're going to work out to stop it. Uh, but uh, it says in the title that he was killed and shot in the back over jaywalking. When you read, when you look at the video, that is never stated. In other words, we have an officer who wants to get in somebody's face who does never explain what his what, what's required, the articulable basis to interfere with someone on the street. And then you don't hear, which I think is as least as important, that that action is something he has to either arrest or, or I guess he can arrest and then and then cite you for. In other words, if I walk into a bathroom where I'm watching you wash your hands because you're going into eat, you're in a restaurant bathroom, and I said, your dog had fleas, and, you, and I tell you, get out of my way, I'm going to eat. Next thing I know, I'm being gunned down is not something that gives the authority to the cop. What's the problem here is he didn't even say the jaywalking. So what if he would have said, you see the video, and he says, well, you were jaywalking, and that was it. And the guy goes, I'm going to go eat. And then you get gunned down. Does that fix it because he made an articulable basis? No, there has to be some consequence that starts to provide the fuller statement. And I'm getting something, I'm working this through a little bit because I, I want to work to a, a potential answer because this is happening across the place. This is, this is not a very populated place to have this happen. The place this happened was in Eagle Point, Oregon. It's in the middle of, out, almost in the middle of nowhere, close to some place. Almost. They never look at the video, and they say in the title that it was jaywalking. We only find that out later, because in the video, you don't hear anything. What you hear is uh, this cop wants to interfere with a guy going to Carl's Jr. A guy goes into Carl's Jr. going to the bathroom. The cop's on his walking in, has to drive up to him, gets out, keeps asking him, what are you doing, what are you doing, never states a thing. Goes into the bathroom with his taser already drawn. Let me. He starts cussing. The cop starts cussing first. I found I didn't hear that the first time. So I had to, again, you got to watch a couple times to get the basis. 
And the cop starts cussing at him and never says why he's there pointing a taser at him. A taser is like pointing a gun at him. They say it's non-lethal force. You find out in this video how, in some instances, how little effect they can have. But I think that's more of an excuse to pull out their other gun. In this case, you hear, well, it's, it's just disconcerting, but you hear literally the cop who yells, gun, gun, doesn't recognize it's one of his guns or his partner's guns. It's one it's its official issue taser on the ground. And upon the, when the guy attack the cop attacks the kid, after he tases him and it doesn't work, and the kid still wants to go to, he wants to come out of the bathroom and wants to go eat, he tackles the he gets tackles the kid because the kid's trying to push his way back. He now touches the cop, and I'm you know there's certain things you don't want to do here, but he did. I'm getting at to the point he the cop never gives an articulable basis or a consequence, and so the kid's saying, "Well, I'm going to eat." The cop ends up tackling him for pushing on him a bit. The gun the taser falls to the ground after some scuffle. A second cop says, gun, gun, and when the cop with, has the kid face down on the bathroom floor, he, the cop pulls out his real gun and shoots him twice, at least twice, I think it was three times, in the back. And so there was a lie about a witness of a gun at all that wasn't the cop's. So I don't want to go too much to the, to the, to the analysis more than to say, he doesn't give an articulable basis and a consequence. Even if he told me that I would understand that he had any authority. And what I want you to look at when you get the link, or if you can find it, look and you think about it, whether or not, you can take your own, certainly take your own opinion, whether or not without that the kid had any right, uh, obligation to do anything, and whether or not when the cop did not do that, he then committed an abduction. When the, when the kid, uh, his name is Graves, Matthew Graves, I shouldn't just talk about, he's dead. He's dead because of a stupidity and a psychopathy, I think, it's in this country. And a jury that allowed it. That's the worst part of this whole thing. That he, the kid did not hear an articulable basis and a consequence. That he wants to go out of the bathroom and the cop won't let him while he's pointing a dangerous weapon at the kid is, to my understanding of the definitions, abduction aggravated. That the jury can't work that through should terrify you. Because this is not the only place this is happening or going to happen. So, what's my resolve and stop talking about this? Because it doesn't matter. The, the kid, Matthew Graves, is dead. It was happened by something on a what we find out later the cop claims was a jaywalking. He wanted to what we hear? He wanted to inf uh, tell the kid of the dangers of jaywalking doesn't sound to me to be an offense that rises to the level of using the gun to you shoot, to you shoot them in the back, whether it was the taser uh, that the tr didn't stun him enough, or the gun, which ends up killing him. That, I think, and this is not to the exclusion of any other idea, or maybe more complete, that we're proving what I said before, that you want this these executions are done under color of law to stop. You now realize the juries are incapable that you need to go forward to your policing agencies, because they're not law enforcement officers. They're policy enforcers. It says it right in every statute. The legislature only does policy now. They policy enforce. They don't ever now have a standard of what they have to do. They can be ignorant of the law. Like why I keep telling you you've got to write your notices about how to make the law work. Why you shouldn't interact with them in the way the kid did and why you shouldn't touch them. But you should be having a word in your mouth about how to interact would have helped this one com tremendously. But nonetheless, you take the view of what you saw and see in the video and you start to write down what the cop didn't do. And you turn around and you go down to your, your local authorities and you say... Put this in the law, or I'm going to sue you to have this put in the law. Like, for instance, and not to the exclusion of any better statement or any more comprehensive view, the, every cop will and have recorded that the articulable basis they speak and tell someone and the consequence that they're going to need to, 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 to answer to and obligated to do on the record to anybody. And uh, no deadly force can ever be used on the instance of a non-felony crime, ever.
any wrongdoing of which is to the exoneration of the of the person set against, because he has what? The right of free association underneath the Constitution. He has the right from being abducted. I'm going a little too far in the statement. The point is, as you start to understand what he's been doing, you start to maybe write a policy. And you walk into the legislators, uh, either in your state and or local, is what I do first, and the police, and you say, institute this policy, or I'm going to force you to institute the policy by suing you. And you make it common sense. And you have regard for the cop's safety, because it's serious stuff that goes on. These guys do get themselves in trouble. But when you articulate what you see as a failure in the cop on such a simple thing as a jaywalking, that had the cop said, you got you for jaywalking, I have to cite you. And the requirement that since it's not a felony, he couldn't use his gun, that policy may have stopped a killing. Or the condition that set up the killing, even if it was done as stupid as it sounds when you look at it. That the answer to the cop wasn't to kill him or attack him or or stop him in the bathroom. It was to let him go stand in line at Carl's Jr. to go order his food while he's pulling out his little citation tag to fill it out while he's standing in line. When that didn't happen, you also know you're dealing with a bunch of, I don't even know what, these people are criminally insane, these cops. But there wasn't a better, more sedate way to to, to answer to to a jaywalking. It has to terrify you folks. The kid didn't do anything that I can see ever. He wasn't even told of it. What? Why wouldn't just standing in line with the kid while he wants to order his food? Couldn't that have happened? You pull out your citation, get the kid's name. He can't lie to you. He's got to give you some name. If you don't have a cop, you don't have a, an idea that he's not the name he gave you. You just have to accept it anyway. Why wasn't that the better answer? Is why you all need to look at that video, make a, a, a list of policy requirements to en- enable you to have you and your society have protection against this type of uh, trigger happy psychopathy is what I've been telling you you're going to have to be doing anyway another example okay, maybe spent too long on that one but maybe I didn't I, I guess it, it just kind of gets at me because this is where I was 30 years ago five cops pointing their guns because they made something up and they were going to make me pay for it and I happened to escape that by I don't know how and I made them pay it, pay for it. Well, that momentum has never stopped. I'm here today with that in my background. On this same point, a guy doing jaywalking who the cop admits he just wanted to talk to the kid to tell him about the dangers of jaywalking is dead because he got shot in the back twice at least by a cop whose only authority was to hand him a citation at best. But he couldn't do that because later he admits he just wants to talk to the kid to tell him about the dangers of jaywalking. In other words, there was no other party involved. You want to talk about people in jail for non, non, uh, well, third party, no, no third party, no victim? Think about this one. And so we have a whole lot going on that is going wrong. I don't know why we're sedate and not moving forward to do this. I'm suggesting you want to make like the the juror making an obstruction, I mean um, an objection for the reason said our verdict is an authority don't do this and and lose my confidence here. You go into this policy saying this is because you aren't capable of doing it yourself. This is what you're going to have to continue, start to do so that we have one more measure to help give a buffer, at least a buffer between your trigger happiness and our lives is what you have to write down now in an official capacity. And anybody that hears what I'm saying or has a thought about the wrongness of this that doesn't start to move toward that and do that, work it out, get some people together if you don't feel comfortable, you literally, as we have seen over and over, could be the next victim to this. And and I can't say it's our fault, but it's our fault. Because we know the condition going in now. And as I say that, I come on to another report we hear all the same week. Uh, Police can violate our rights without fear of being sued. 
But why is that? If you go read this story, why, why is that? That ends up being the case. Because they're not given notice of what their delineation is. Remember, I told you that the, uh, it looked to me like the robots, the uh, AI. If the AI is not programmed to not do a thing, it can't be held to a thing. If the, if the, law, the, uh, the policy enforcers, the psychopaths, or the, the costume ones, if they're not told not to do something, they're not held liable to it. And that's on top of the occupying force standard that I tell you about in the Libra Code. If we didn't program these idiots with guns that they can't, then they can't be held liable. I'm saying go in and make a policy that they can't, and now they might be able to. At least you have the grounds, hopefully even in civil side, to show, wait a minute, now the video said you started cussing. That's the wrong part, number one. Number two, you called him dude, not sir. That's another point that's not showing disrespect. Number three, you didn't, most importantly, say what the option, what the what the actionable violation is, and what you're going to do relative to that. You make a policy when those, at least those three things can't, don't happen, you don't have an immunity. And if you lie about that, it's a felony. If you lie about your cause, it's a felony. See, you, you start to constrain this. You have to, because they're not going to do it to themselves. They're in charge of deciding for their own. You see the prosecutor turns it over. Oh, it wasn't me. It was the jury. You don't know the jury's stacked anyway. They're too stupid and ignorant and clueless if they weren't. And why do I say that? Look at our society, folks. I got one guy to step up to do a comment. I can't. I, that excites me, folks. One. The rest of you that I don't know about, okay, that's fine. I kind of doubt that you're out there. But that's our problem. And so here we are, folks. We get shot in the back. Didn't do anything. You look at the video. You tell me whether he's told what the authority was, what, what the authorita was trying to do, and whether that authorita was valid. Why wasn't the alternative just to talk with the guy? If he wants to talk to the guy, let's go stand in the line. I got food to eat. And then I thought about this, and I thought, I think I want you to understand something else. See, I have a different thought process and word in my mouth. I put myself in that position. What would I say? Now, I certainly would have said different stuff. But when it came to the point that he wasn't going to let me in, wouldn't it have been something, and I usually do this, I usually don't eat. I usually wait. I get involved in a project, and I'll go hours without thinking about it, and all of a sudden, I'm done. My mind is done. I have no energy. I have no concentration. I get that. I get this kid can only be, and he ends up having some psychological problems. But I suppose being in diminished, what, uh, blood uh, glucose levels and all that nonsense stuff that we get ourselves into, yeah, that happens to me a lot. So when that cop stopped me from eating, wouldn't it have been one of the things I assert that you are interfering with the food that's causing me to have trouble. I'm not functioning correctly here without my food. You're interfering with me being in a medical emergency. You're putting me close to a medical emergency by interfering with me. Couldn't you have that in your mind to say? I'm telling you that are aware, have that in your mind. Because that's usually that's really what would happen if I'm, especially if I'm walking into. A, I don't think I ever go to a, a, a Carl's Jr. If you found me in a Carl's Jr., I'm near death. I, I'm just looking for the next thing. I just need something in my mouth. I waited way too long. So I my mean, point is, is you got to look at that dynamic here, and you better have a better word in your mouth than this kid did. Uh, even although I don't think he had a mental capacity, I think he knew exactly what was going on. He knew he didn't have to deal with that, and he wasn't going to deal with it. And the cop had a different thought about that. And the cop was wrong in my estimation. And I want you to see whether or not that's truth. And I want you to lay out why for yourself. Why was it wrong? And I'm laying out a few for you. And I'm certainly open to discussion on this because this is killing us, folks. We all complain, oh, well, the cops are doing dirt to everybody. But no one's stepping up uh, in, in, in any substantial way to stop it. So I guess that's my plea to most of you all. If we can't, you know, you can't write a cannabis letter, I don't know what I expect, but I do expect to see the, take what I said, take a lead on what I said, go research out the validity of it, then put it in writing, and then go in and say, this has got to stop. This is not, I don't want this to happen in my town. And persist until it gets done. Hound these people until they get it done. Uh, look on both sides. Look for the safety side. 
they're going to have their side, and I already got that. They have some answers, but it's not going to be substantive against not doing what the law already requires. You just put that down in writing. It becomes a writing in a policy and or an ordinance. And why are you doing that? Because that's also to the county coffers. You're, you're protecting the county as well uh, against these uh, guys who just get covered over, whether by union contract or whatever. I don't know what it all is by the court's covering of the occupation that's against you, that these office, these are soldiers in the war against you. Their control is in the policy. And where does this extension also come, these layers of attack? It, it comes to, what did I say? We're not in justice. Here, yeah, we're in justice. We're no just, we're not... The courts don't do justice, they res, they're in re, courts of resolution. Where does that come from? That's the bar. What's the bar tied into? Sustainable development. What did they admitted that is? It's an idea. And they'll do what they can get away with to impose it. Where does that come from? The UN, the global order that we keep hearing about. One of them. What's the standard? It's whatever they, the future th we want, which is not you, make. So this policing standard is international standard. Remember, we had Israeli uh, Mossad. Uh, we heard, heard all the reports years ago. We're going and training all your police to do what? To kill you. It wasn't to enforce American law, was it? We're here today, folks. This kid does. This kid is another one. Like uh, Lee Cole, right after me, I survived. Lee Cole didn't. And then years ago, you know, just a few years ago, long years after that, well, Oscar Grant in BART. And, and so many others gunned down from this stupidity they call police officers. Not law enforcement. Not do a good turn. Not actually try to help you. Not get along in your society. No, these are enforcers. It comes from this, this global mentality that they've been pushing on you and pushing so you can finally buy into it. And the only, only thing I know is to push back is to make writings again it's against it, again it, so that there's an objective basis is why you do that. It's not opinion. See, that's how they beat you down. They make up a fraudulent opinion about, oh, it's an alternative, we need to do this. No, I want to do the law first. Let's start with the law. We'll see what we need after that. And the law you need, because you're a psychopath with a gun that can't control yourself, you need to be told this, because we know that the court said that you can't be held to anything unless you are told. How easy has that been to understand, folks, when I, I've told it to you years ago, and here's the case that comes out. Appeals court says the police don't, aren't liable until they're told. When I told you, you need to make policies to tell them, even of the most basic things. This is going to be tedious, but I don't know what else to do here, folks. I'm not telling you I like doing this. I'm not telling you I want to even do it. I'm just saying it needs to be done now. This kid is the... I think the primary example to us to inform us on what it is, how we're going to proceed, what we need to proceed upon. And there's so much more, but this kid gives us one. I've laid out, some, I think, some that are in the law. Do not invade the space of the cop and their safety. And, do, and as I provide the, a couple of, of um, statements, it, it doesn't encroach upon their decision-making either. So you have to look at all that when you write something. But I think I've laid out at least the basics. Someone can pick that up, write it down. If you do that, maybe you'll be the example for some other people. And so they can pick that up and it can carry along. You know, the, the pebble in, in, the, in the pond, if you will, the ripple effect goes out. But what is this? This global construction is on us, folks. I, tell you about, I talk to you about it all the time. Globalization. This comes from Charles U. Smith. But I wanted to point out something about this. I, I like the way this guy, what this guy brings up, but I always find that there's something kind of short on what he's talking to or his focus globalization has hollowed out our hollowed out rural america well i don't know if you know about east uh, eagle point uh, oregon uh, it's a, like a rural area it's, it's it's just not a small it's just a small place it may be attached to a large, little large area but even that area is not that much i mean it's a, it's a little bit it is a it is con considered a metro hub multimodal area it's an international port, near an international port and all that but Notwithstanding that, it is on the outskirts. So this, is, this kind of speaks to that. Globalization has hollowed out rural America. Well, rural America is really most of America. 
And we know that this agenda, that the resolution, not justice, but resol resolving things, reflexive law in the international sense, sense with the Bar Association, the House of Delegates, which is in your state, implements reflexively like a knee-jerk reaction to do what? Knee-jerk with it to support what they're doing. Globalization has hollowed out uh, American rule America, and then Charles goes along and explains some of it. And I, it's valid enough. What I wanted to expose here is this implementation that gets these cops out and further and further and starts to kill people that are, who care less they could care less about the cops a lot of times. They're not we're not criminals. That's probably why we're out in the rural area, but see it comes out to you folks. There's nothing going to be a stop. You have to stop it from encroaching. Uh, he goes on and talks about well let's see well, what do we make of, of an economy in which a handful of uh, bubblicious urban areas are magnets for jobs and capital while rural communities have been hollowed out. And he talks about this from the urban side, the urban discussion about how the rural communities, based on the focus of putting people into urban areas, uh, is causing the problem. Let me offer something. This is looking at, a, at an effect. And it's true. That, that, as I told you, it's, you can have to be 100% true. But if you're not after the cause, it, it's problematic. For me, this is not after the cause. The, the hollowing out of anything rural, the rural is a derogatory term. It actually should be defined as the countryside. That's where the people are, in the countryside. The country and the countryside. Not rural regions and all this globalization terminology, which Charles uses. The, the hollowing out is the imposition of this rural-urban divide F fiction, w while it takes out your local, pr your the production of your countryside, and the other provisions that are brought to bear to strip your countryside of its wealth, your watersheds of their wealth production factor. This is not talking in actual economy. It's actual. It's pre-economy. It's production wealth that ripples out through that's being hollowed out by such things as the Forest Service doing their nonsense, uh, the sustainable development. More importantly, what we sued in 2013, the, uh, 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 the, uh, and enjoined it uh, because of the default, again, at law, the uh, uh, alternative dispute resolution that's cons that furthers the consensus process. They've hollowed out the productive capacity. It has nothing to do with the urban areas, actually. That's the effect of what's going on. That's the focus that they put us on. I don't want to criticize Charles too much, but I want us to see, yeah, the globalization's there. It is something. It's an effect. But there's a way they're getting at us, and the method is what you have to attack, not the thing they've done. You, could, you can't change the economies of a countryside. You have to build back in the production capacity to make the wealth, which creates economies. And then they say economies of scale. For instance, a miner produces minerals. He, on his own, creates four levels of, three levels of economy past him. It's the businesses that create the support to him, and then those businesses support those businesses, and then those things that support all that. And when you finally get it out to where we're making income, that's all the support and services you know about, like bookkeepers and all this other stuff. And so I want to point out, this not be careful about the focalization on globalization more than the method that's happening in your town right now. The cops of which killing us are, are an example. The, the, the failure of the international focus uh, on the FDA to condemn things that are for our production, like the m mushrooms and then cannabis. So uh, anyway, hope, that, uh, hope this uh, gives you some insight. Hope you step up to do something. Thank you, the commenter to the, to the cannabis. Uh, Grimner, thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. And anybody else that's uh, mirroring the site and say, folks, uh, you're not liking the broadcast, so I don't know. I'm feeling kind of hard, hard pressed to wonder why you're not liking me here on this broadcast. That's what gets us out. So I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs or nature willing. That's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
Well, that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. 